Let's welcome our guest, Dr. Wisdom Enak. He is a senior energy consultant and analyst. Good morning, Dr. Wisdom Egnan. Happy new month. Dr. Wisdom, are you there? Can are you, you there, hear Dr. Us? Wisdom? Oh, yeah, the, the line was back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. We can hear you clearly. Okay, the line was a bit shaky. Good morning. Good morning. Happy new month. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, so my first question, we're talking about financial inclusion. How can governments effectively measure the impact of their financial inclusion programs and use this information you know, to inform future policy decision? All right, I think we'll have a bit of a network, network yes. challenge, you know, um, so we, ha we lost the call, but mm. we'll definitely have Dr. Wisdom join us back. You know, we're talking about, we're evaluating the effectiveness of government's program mm. in supporting vulnerable populations, and you always say one thing, that at this point in time, everybody's vulnerable, but <laughs> I learned <laughs> Dr. Wisdom is back, you want to pick him up on that question? Dr. Wisdom, welcome back. Dr. Wisdom and Ang, welcome back. Thank you very much. All right. I don't know whether they got the last question, but let me repeat it again. How can government effectively measure the impact of their financial inclusion programs and use this information to inform future policy decisions? All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think very important question that you've asked here. And in fact, the question goes to even question what is our aims and our goals and even the objectives of the financial inclusion program. So I'm going to take on the World Bank okay. for mm. something they said, which was the issue of cash hand handouts. Mm -hmm. And I think it is counterproductive to just say you uh, hand people cash. Uh, and the reason I'm saying so is one, Nigeria is roaming a largely informal uh, banking system where a lot of the money is banked as cash. Uh, We keep oh. losing the network has is really you know but he was trying to make some certain things about um, world bank and at that statement that world bank make i think that's one of the um the most the honest statements that world bank have actually why do you tag it as honest sometimes they roll out the same world bank have told us that we should support um president Tinubu's initiatives or uh, reforms and policies and all that they give certain uh, statements or certain reviews that you might not necessarily want to agree with. But let's have Dr. Wisdom. Uh, Dr. Wisdom, you were about to start your thoughts. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So sorry about the so network sorry glitch. About the network. Yeah. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is the first thoughts that we need to put into place is the fact that um, it, it all starts with the intents of the government mm. when they're rolling financial inclusion programs. Are uh, these just programs that are meant to give a statistics, say, for example, 25 million Nigerians have received cash transfers of 50,000 Naira, for an example, or are they really aimed at certain groups of people? And then how do we measure uh, the productivity that that money has gone to bring? Remember, the inflationary situation that we find ourselves today is due to the fact that uh, we do have a lot of uh, money, a, a lot of quantum of money, and that money isn't matching the productivity levels in the economy. And so rather than money matching productivity levels, it is matching speculative activities in the economy. And it's going around speculating around the dollar naira. So this is what you're finding. And the truth be told, you know, uh, I, I like to say that the government hasn't done quite well in on this, making sure that their uh, programs are results oriented. Mm -hmm. I don't see the numbers saying that we reeled out XYZ amount to XYZ people, and this is how much we have changed their life. We have lifted them out of poverty. I don't see that feedback. And so the intent is more political than economic. Okay. All right. Um, uh, before Sarah comes in, uh, you mentioned about this cash transfers and you said that, yes, uh, you don't agree with it. Now, what about some other states? I mean, in one particular state, a governor donated sugarcane to youth as a way of alleviating poverty. And in another state, a governor donated wheelbarrow. And we've had, you know, these state governors come out with this, come up with this certain initiative to try and alleviate them out of um, economic crisis or poverty. 
What do you say about is that a good initiative or can they should they do better? I mean, to be honest, right, um, I think when you look at the initiatives that some of those governors put together, I think they can do better. The first thing starts with what are we trying to achieve? If we're trying to achieve just, uh, you know, peasant farming, just give them enough for them to uh, farm their produce and get whatever results, okay, that's a starting point. And the reason I say it's a starting point is because uh, there have been pilot cases that we, you know, I have been involved in where you hand people seedling and the seedling doesn't yield the kind of produce that you would think it would naturally yield. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, I've, I've been, I mean, I, I've done cucumber myself, and I thought I would get a very good uh, yield, mm. but I, I got less than a 55% yield rate. The rest of them just died and did not work out. So my, my, my question is, how much of that goes into germination? How much of that uh, finally grows into a, a product that can be monetized? Uh, what... Uh, what are the government doing in terms of uh, buying some of this produce off the farmers, either through a cooperative society and, uh, you know, commingling those quantities into highly commercial quantities for exports, either to other states or to outside the country? These are things that, you know, needs to be done across the value chain to truly harness the value of those products. It's not just... Uh, handing people the seedling. That's very, very, very early on, on the value chain right. of farming. I may not yield the results uh, on, on, its, on its own. All right. So the topic is financial inclusion, evaluating the effect of government programs and supporting vulnerable populations. I like to pick the keyword vulnerable. Now, maybe five years ago or three years ago, I would not classify myself as a vulnerable person. But this year, I might say, OK, I'm now a vulnerable person. So based on the current economic reality, what are the measures, first off, that the government should use or that should be adopted in categorizing those that are vulnerable, what is the yardstick used in measuring this? Considering the fact that we've not even had a census in like how many years, so how do we know who is vulnerable? That's my first question to you, Dr. Wisdom. All right, I think uh, for, for, for me, I think the first thought people would say is, uh, you know, use the BVM uh, and then find out how much people have in their accounts, but the banked population is quite minute compared to the rest of the population. And I, I'd like to beg for a bit of both. The reason I'd like to beg for a bit of both is use the BVN, uh, look at the sort of uh, balance, uh, you know, maximum balance, or sorry, total balance that people get within the year. Uh, that's on one part. And then you could put a second layer in to say, work with the subnationals and develop their vulnerable persons register that says these are the poorest of the poor. Uh, sometimes you come up with a situation where the name repeats, the people that you use the first layer to capture uh, will, will be the same as the people that the subnationals were identified. Then, of course, you know that um, you know, you, you've got it right, and of course, it should only uh, appear once. All right. Uh, but it just helps you to know that you have been, been at the position where you, your methods uh, have repeatability in the way you're sourcing your information. Uh, but ultimately, I think, um, y yes, there is no, with, because of the Nigerian system, there isn't any uh, absolute approach that we could say, yes, this will yield the most vulnerable people. It's an iterative approach. Start from the two methods that I've talked about, the subnational registers and the BVN, and then fine-tune them as required. But the goal should ultimately be show that these guys were once vulnerable, and through your reforms, they have started some SMEs that have supported them. Now, let me give you some little context. Okay. Uh, what is happening in another developing country in uh, India? I have been to India personally, and uh, there's a, if you notice one thing about India, there's a lot of people doing fruits, a lot of people doing uh, maybe some pastries on the roadside and their local food. And they have a lot of sheds. They put them in front of the shops and do these things. Now, what happens is I met a lady who said she was quite vulnerable uh, financially, 
and uh, she had some support from the government. She opened that, and now she's not on the list anymore. And she has admitted. I mean, she's been honest enough to say, "Look, I'm I don't no need this support vulnerable. anymore." Hmm. Correct. I'm no longer vulnerable. So it's a bit of making sure you were monitoring that people uh, that were vulnerable may not also be vulnerable tomorrow. It's also a bit of Nigerians being patriotic. I'll give you another example. When I was um, uh, talking, doing a social experiment around the NPAR scheme, yeah. I found out that a lot of people had their normal jobs and through one connection or the other, were still applying and they were oh, on NPAR scheme <laughs> getting money. And I asked them, mm -hmm. Why? They say, this is a national cake. Don't question mm -hmm. us why we're doing this. This is our national cake. And this is, uh, we'll just, this is our own version of it. So I think it's also being honest, because if the citizens are not honest, there are a thousand and one ways to uh, circumvent the system and make it fail. Right. So there's a part, there's a role for citizens to play. I think your government also needs to go more into rural areas because a lot, you mentioned something about BVA, knowing the amounts in the account and all of that. There are a lot of people that are unbanked in these rural and community areas. And if we decide to go that route, we might not get the exact statistics. But the second question I'd like to ask you now is, now that we've you know been able to put vulnerability in a context, how can governments balance the need for regulation and oversight with the need for innovation and entrepreneurship in the financial sector to promote financial inclusion for vulnerable populations? Okay, this is where I talk about domesticating of technology, right? I think the biggest problem that we have is that we, we apply technology in a way that it is suited for the developed clients, but we do not domesticate it or tailor it down to the Nigerian problem. You've raised a very important point, and the most important point will be how do we even create the incentive to uh, you know, bring some of those most vulnerable people uh, into focus? Uh, that's the first thing. And I think um, the second thing will be how do we then fine tune our technology to make sure that it solves the problem like we've just reeled out. And uh, for me, the, the first concern, you know, what we need to do is to ensure that there are schemes that encourage people that are vulnerable to get uh, registered at the subnational level, uh, to also encourage that the subnational do their best to bet that this is really true. Like I'll harp on what my state governor is doing in Akpaibo. What he has done there is a vulnerable persons register, but also the 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 all the way from the village, all the way from the clan level and all the way down to the local government level, the ward level and the local government level, there are structures in place to verify that those people are truly vulnerable. Uh, and so, I mean, the, you don't know a vulnerable person in a different local government than the people themselves in that local government. All right. And so he has put a... Uh, okay. Please go ahead. He has put modalities in place. And the second one I talked about was the technology I think this is where we need to start doing some, uh, I, I like to say some hackathon, hackathon challenges for the young minds, because the young minds in each locality know exactly how to develop technologies to solve that problem. I don't think we're doing that enough. We're waiting for some of these uh, startup companies to build like the universal solution for our financial programs. But we have very young minds within the local regions who can get engaged in a competitive manner to breathe uh, solutions for that uh, region, who, which could then be integrated by the existing uh, fintech companies. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Wisdom Enang. Uh, we've exhausted time, but maybe we'll have a part two of this particular you know, topic. But thank you very much for sharing your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Do enjoy your morning, sir. We wish you the very same. Thank you so much.